Now, we, we want to look at uh, these factors that uh, most of you have highlighted uh, about uh, the, the reason of being the, the root causes for uh, Africa's uh, uh, 21st century uh, coups. So I will take the, the issue of uh, accountability, transparency, and maybe a lack of fair representation and uh, others. So now, uh, uh, Dr. Eddie, looking at all of this, and uh, most especially the uh, non-respect of uh, constitutions, we know uh, this is one uh, reason that has actually exacerbated uh, coup d'etat in Africa, the constant change of constitution and uh, how the leadership that does not actually deliver to the expectations or the aspirations of the general public. But I always uh, accentuate uh, that a debate program like this is not to blame. We blame and then we look for solutions. Now that we know what is happening, the areas of uh, accountability, transparency, fair representation, and uh, you can name the rest. How can we now reshape Africa's political scene? Because we cannot uh, actually deny that there's a political revolution across the continent of Africa. Now that it is there, and military uh, coups are already seeming to be one of, of the, the very practical ways to actually uh, bring back things into play. So in your perspective, what can be done in the contemporary globalized society for a better Africa. It's not just talking, but looking for practical solutions that will solve the problems of all Africans. Thank you, Clarice. Uh, before I uh, jump into this question, two points I want to make very quickly following my brother Elijah. He made a uh, strong uh, statement that I think I will uh, build on more and more and more. I agree with him when he said that, you know, uh, Africans are not allergic to democracy. And I think that's the point that we have to make, because we have heard, you know, uh, uh, Euro-centered, you know, uh, 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 political pundits, or as you call them, or uh, analysts uh, talking about, you know, uh, Africa is not a fit for democracy. Sheikh Antadiop, you know, will not agree with that. When we look at our African traditional cultures, it is clear that elements of democracy existed in there. And I think, uh, Brother Elijah, that is a very strong point that, you know, what you're making in there. Second thing that I will call all my colleagues and maybe in the future uh, also to analyze. When we talk about you know, those things, we talk about geopolitics, as I said last time, geopolitics is also the language. For instance, when we talked about you know, some of the coups that we call constitutional coups, all of those coups are constitutional coups. The reason being that you have leaders who actually are using the uh, softer terms of constitutional coups to make it uh, different from any military takeover. But a military takeover is also an abridgment or uh, an infringement on the constitution. So all of them, I think as uh, uh, African-centered analysts, Pan-Africanists, if I can also use that term in there, we need to come up with a very good terminology that will recapture all of those coups, whether they are what we call constitutional by civilian regimes or by a military uh, takeover. This uh, will be another way, actually, Clarice, for me to answer your question about what do we do? One of the things that we have to do is the terms, again, that we use to describe the uh, political situation in Africa and the political uh, phenomenon that happened. Some leaders, when you look at them, Cote d'Ivoire, for instance, uh, the current head of state in Cote d'Ivoire, is uh, quick and ready to mount a, a military intervention, pushing for that, you know, when it comes to Niger. But the question is, what is your own credibility? Second question is, and I'm glad that, you know, what the uh, 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 president, you know, in Nigeria has kind of tampered a little bit, you know, his uh, first reaction in terms of military intervention in uh, uh, Niger to uh, bring, uh, depose, you know, uh, President Bazoum uh, back into uh, power. And now he's even uh, promoting the idea of a nine month uh, transition in Niger. But when you look at him also, look at the debacle of this. Uh, so expected Nigerian elections that took place in, 19, uh, in 2003, February past. Where is the legitimacy? And then when you talk about the president in Togo as well, how legitimate are you as a ruler in this echo was, for instance, to mount an army to intervene somewhere when we know that yourself came to power by what? Manipulation of the constitution in 2005 when your father died. So 
that is what needs to be done. And I'm going to enumerate them, you know, uh, in a, maybe uh, two minutes. Number one, how do we seize the moment? There are lessons to be learned from the past. Where do we get those, uh, do we get those lessons? As I said, Nigeria gave us at least a glimpse of an example in 1999 when General Abu Salami Abu Bakar took over. Nine months of a transition to set Nigeria on the course of some elections. Whether the system has improved till today, that's another question. We're going to ask the INEC, uh, the Independent uh, National Elections Commission of Nigeria, why the uh, February 2003 election failed. That's the thing. But at least we know that Nigeria has been every four years organizing some elections to uh, 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 designate you know, with their leader. Second example that we can also build on in the past is the case of Ghana. Late President you know, Jerry Rawlings has ruled this country, but by 1992, he set the course that everybody is talking about today. So Nigerians, uh, Nigerian, uh, Gabonese, all of us in here need to go back in and sit down the same way we have studied the transition that was uh, instrumented in Benin, a pacific, calm, quietest transition that led the country to have a new prime minister, Monseigneur de Souza, and have uh, President Keroku in India. So there are lessons to learn from the past in Africa. But moving forward, moving forward, another thing that needs to be done, the civil society in Africa needs to master or flex its muscle more and more and be more intentional when it comes to civic engagement. Clarice, the reasons why, and all my colleagues have said it you know, earlier, but I'm just trying to say it in another word, we are seeing what we are seeing is because our political institutions are weak in reality. Not only they are weak, there is no clear separation of power, and you have an executive that can mount all that they can mount. And also the reason why people are, uh, the civil society is weak, is that we lack citizens. When people are impoverished, and you wait election to see uh, a candidate walking around with bags of rice, what do you expect, as uh, my brother Elijah said, for from people who are living in such, you know, uh, uh, aspect of poverty, no clear access to, you know, to help centers, what do you expect for them, from them? You can expect only for them not to follow in the trends that, that you have in in there. So the civil society organizations need to really bring it in there. That's why worker unions, informal sector unions, uh, youth organizations, it is their moment to uh, rise up to stand up in those different countries that are currently on the military coup in order to influence the current leaders in a way that the people will love. Again, I remember the 1990s when we talk about the National Day of Dialogue Days or National Transitional Days. There were opportunities for people to create this new space where not only people will speak, but also participate in the drafting of new constitutions. Last thing that I want to mention very quickly is the political behavior and what I call a, a, a cultural behavior. If we are where we are, again, rehashing what Brother Elijah and others have said, is because our political institutions are weak, but because the culture of stability is not well entrenched, not just in our institutions, but also in the ways in which people behave. Those things, I believe, are the areas where uh, uh, interventions, you know, can uh, be uh, done to make sure that uh, in Mali, Burkina Faso, uh, 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 Niger now, Gabon, as we are seeing, whatever is behind, there is room, right, for the uh, African population. And here again, I'm going to insist on the civil society with all the elements that I mentioned before to play a role in influencing from within what uh, is happening in such a way that those uh, military transition can really lead to a period of uh, uh, stability, politically first, socially said, and then the economic aspect you know, will come uh, in and there. And that also goes into understanding clearly what are the implications of those changes that we are seeing with, uh, for the relationship that those countries are uh, having with external powers. We are talking about France, 
We're talking about, you know, uh, the United States. We're talking about, you know, Russia, even today, the BRICS countries. But we are also talking about the influence within the regional economic bodies, because that's another reshaping. ECOWAS and others are also being reshaped by what is uh, happening here. And Clarice, this is what I wanted to say in here in terms of uh, what can be done. Uh, and I'm sure that my colleagues, you know, will, will uh, also uh, add on to that.